Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. It is our 11th post-game edition of this 2022 season. Daniel Gallen joining us uh, from the great state of New Jersey. Tyler Donahue here in Happy Valley headquarters. Unfortunately, I did not make the travel roster this week. You could probably anticipate that listening to the podcast the last few days. Uh, I was not ready to make my trip to Piscataway, uh, but certainly Penn State was. And Daniel, a 55-10 to victory makes it really hard to remember that this was a 10-7 Rutgers lead in the first quarter, and it adds to what has been a tremendously dominant run through Big Ten opponents here in November for the number 11 Nittany Lions. It's pretty wild when you look at the drive chart and you see that Penn State went punt, 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 fumble, punt, and they have a 14-10 win, or 14-10 lead in the first half. Um, It felt kind of like oh, this is going to be a bit of a a dogfight. This might be – you kind of went back and forth where you you were like, oh, this might be an ugly, like, 17-13, 20-17 game, or it could end up being some sort of shootout, um, the way that both teams kind of were were scoring and the way Rutgers was moving the ball early. But Penn State really buckled down defensively, and then the the offense kind of found its footing and, and really got going, took advantage of a short field. Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at 55, 10 Penn state closed with 48 unanswered points. Rutgers just really had no answer. And I think that when you look at what Penn state has done these last couple of weeks in big 10 play, this is kind of what you wanted to see them being able to take advantage of inferior competition, um, pour it on and get a couple big wins. This was a career win number 100 for James Franklin. 76 of those victories have come over watching this uh, Nittany Lions squad. And as we work our way through the Rutgers Penn State history, we we kind of said it's it is what it is. It's going to be the same kind of deal where you may see Penn State sleepwalking. They'll come out of it. They'll win by 20 to 30 points somewhere in that range, cover the spread, but won't do it overwhelmingly. That changed today because when they snapped out of it, they took control and they didn't let up. And and that included putting waves of backups in as this game progressed for the third consecutive week. I thought what really stood out was the uh, the, 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 well, obviously what really stood out was the non offensive touchdowns. One returned by Nick Singleton. That was the first score of the day. You had two fumble returns, one by Kobe King in that first quarter uh, where Penn State had two first downs and two touchdowns, and and they had the lead uh, in Piscataway despite uh, Rutgers getting some things done and getting a short field. Um, And then you had Jair Brown, which was really the nail in the coffin for all intents and purposes of any hope for the Scarlet Knights team. Uh, Third quarter, Curtis Jacobs back in action, comes up with a big hit on on Gavin Wimsatt, who – has some growing pains he's going through against some of the Big Ten's better opponents here as a first-time starter. Um, and that's returned by Jair Brown, who you covered uh, this week, homecoming to New Jersey, a Trenton native. He goes 70 yards in that sprint, his second-to-last Big Ten game, uh, something he'll remember forever. But I don't think any of us will forget the fact that they had three touchdowns without needing to put the ball in their offense's hands. That matches the amount of total touchdowns that have been scored against Penn State through three games in the month of November. They also had a fourth uh, touchdown taken off the board when Johnny Dixon's pick six uh, got called back because of a block by Kaziah Izzard. Um, but even then, Penn State just needed a couple plays to, to punch it in. Um, I think that today kind of showed uh, what we've talked about a little bit with the defense. Manny Diaz obviously has that very attacking, turnover-minded um, defense, but it's kind of the – I think we saw today the difference between a PBU – and an interception. We saw the difference between a quarterback hurry versus an actual sack. We saw the difference between just like a raw tackle for loss and getting a forced fumble. Um, I think that that's something that kind of stood out to me where um, it wasn't kind of like, oh, like it was close. They forced an incompletion and a punt. I mean, there's plenty of that, but it was Curtis Jacobs got there. They got the quarterback on the ground. The ball came out. Then something happened. I think that today really showed the value um, of getting those turnovers, the value of kind of finishing those plays, um, which is something that has been kind of here and there with this defense. I know that, um, you know, after, after the Ohio state game, the, some of the conversation was about the pass rush, not being there. I mean, you look at, I mean, they got 40 tackles for loss in the past three games. Um, I think 17 sacks in that span too. Defense has woken up. Um, in a big way. And I think today they really put together a, a complete performance just outside of, you know, one or two busts. 
This is three straight games, Daniel, where Manny Diaz, who certainly belongs on that list of top college football assistants right now, and his defense hold the opponent to fewer than 200 yards. I mean, that is quite the string together that you're that you're doing right now, coming off of what happened against Ohio State. Um, we, we talked about motivation on both sides of the ball after that matchup, and, and we have seen the results defensively. They were without Curtis Jacobs last week. Both of the last couple of weeks were without Joey Porter Jr. Is Joey Porter Jr. going to be the deciding uh, outcome uh, with, with Rutgers on the other side of the field? No, but to be able to put it together, complete kind of package performances like this against the Maryland and to a lesser degree offensively against a, a Rutgers team that has really struggled to produce things offensively this year. They fired their offensive coordinator and historically 10 points is a big p output for them in, in, in this series. Their 10 points in the first quarter matches the most points they've scored against Penn State at any point as Big Ten opponents. That's all the way back in 2014. They ended up staying right there at 10. They got their touchdown on a short field goal. Aaron Crookshank, who's been doing this in the Big Ten for several years now, setting up his offenses with short fields, did it for Rutgers. They were able to go up 10-7. to 7, uh, But ultimately, Kobe King puts Penn State in front. Sean Clifford able to settle in a little bit, scores a touchdown on the ground, throws a touchdown through the air. By the way, his touchdown to Tyler Warren broke, I believe, an 0 for 9 combined mark for these teams on third downs uh, early through the season. So he hits Tyler Warren for a, a touchdown, and all of a sudden Penn State's up 28 to 10 at halftime. You can start writing that game story, and all due respect to Rutgers uh, at my alma mater, but, but it was not in the cards. It was not going to be in the cards. And this is basically – uh, Penn State, though, in a different way, being able to, to put Rutgers in its place and really elevate itself that they hadn't been able to do in this series. Penn State hadn't reached 30 points against Rutgers since 2017. Again, this is a game where you're typically late in the season saying, well, you're adding a win to that bowl case, but you're not really doing much else. They added a win to their bowl case today. And by the way, they've now got five wins against Power 5 opponents by at least a 28-point margin. That's among national leaders. But they also showed a lot of signs of what's to come in the Big Ten because it was the true freshman running back. It was the true freshman a linebacker. You had the true freshman left tackle for a third straight game, second consecutive game in which you're going for 200-plus on the ground. And, man, there's just a lot of reasons where you look at this and you think nine wins is, is great in a vacuum here. It's what Penn State needed to be, you know, nine and two right now through 11 games. It's really the, the answer is the bell in a lot of ways after an 11-11 stretch. But what they're doing, and we've talked about it all week, I feel like coming up to this game, is they are setting up a launch pad for you. It's not a finish line they're going to get to a 10-2 or maybe 11-2 in, in a marquee bowl matchup. It feels like it's more of a stepping stone. And that's a lot more exciting to deal with than when you're kind of on the last hurrah with an extremely veteran group and you're trying to send them out. You got some guys who want to say, hey, thanks for everything, good luck. But let's face it, a lot of the guys in the field today that were impacting this game and have been impacting games in November – we anticipate they're going to be around for at least another year. I think when you look at the Big Ten and, and the context of these last couple of wins, you wanted to see Penn State take that step forward after going 11 and 11 the past two years to kind of refine their footing. And the Big Ten is pretty stratified, and, and especially in the East Division, where it's Ohio State and Michigan at the top. The bottom is some combination of Maryland, Rutgers, uh, and Indiana. And Michigan State and Penn State kind of occupy that, that middle part of it, where last year we saw Michigan State be in that upper tier. We've seen Penn State be in that upper tier before. Um, but, you know, this year you wanted to see them take that step, you know, where it's only Ohio State and Michigan um, ahead of them to kind of refine their footing. Um, and I think that they really did that authoritatively uh, these past three weeks because – Maryland, Indiana, Rutgers, you know, that's the bottom three teams in this division. And Penn State made them look like the bottom three teams of the division. Um, and I think when you combine, you know, beating everyone who's supposed to be worse than you badly. Um, and then obviously people don't like the losses to Ohio State. They really don't like that loss to Michigan, how that went. Um, but I think that what Penn State has done is really reestablish themselves um, in the Big Ten kind of put that base under them because they do have so much coming back where this does feel like a launch pad. Um, these past two years were so shaky that now there there's stability. Now you have something real to build off of. And I just think from a big picture standpoint, it's like they just took care of business. Um, yeah. You know, they've this, this run of quarterback play, I, I tweeted about it. It's, 
been bad like these past three you haven't enjoyed the view daniel i mean as an objective (laughs) as an objective football reporter no Uh, yeah i mean like that jack tuttle brendan soresby dexter williams experience at indiana whatever talia tonga was doing last week and then (laughs) gavin wimsat today it's just like none of these quarterbacks really scared you um in any way i think that Coming into going to the Maryland game and going into today, there you kind of had that thought where okay, maybe, um, especially the Tonga Bailoa last week with the talent, you know, you thought maybe they can make some things happen. You know, I feel like we've really only been hearing good things about Wimsat um, at Rutgers and you know what he can be. Uh, and he was coming off a good week against a, a bad Michigan State defense, uh, mm-hmm. but just the amount of balls that he was just sailing over his receivers. Um, there was one sequence where he had a uh, running back out of the backfield free uh, on a wheel and he threw it lo- low, bounced it in. I think that was the second down. And then on the third down, he, he missed his receiver again. Um, it was, there were plays there for Rutgers and they just weren't able to do it because they just, you know, the talent isn't there, that the, the team isn't there. Um, and I think Penn state was really able to, to take advantage of those mistakes and that's what you want to see um, from from your defense, from from your team. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was just the thing that I, I really thought of today is that you know the past three weeks, you know, Indiana and Rutgers aren't good football teams. Maryland probably is probably a fine football team that just happened to play their their worst game of the year. Um, and Penn State took advantage of it, uh, which is what you're supposed to do when you're a good football team. Yeah. Elsewhere in the Big Ten today, Indiana ends up uh, coming from behind and, and winning on the road at Michigan State. We'll see the Spartans come in. That's not where the Spartans wanted to be uh, going into the season finale at five and six. And oh, by the way, Maryland, as they seem to do often down in College Park, made Ohio State sweat for it a bit down there on this Saturday. But the Buckeyes are still unbeaten. Michigan's still unbeaten. They will meet very soon to determine what happens out of the Big Ten East and who is the heavy favorite in the conference title game and presumably to get into the college football playoff. But we said it since October 29th, and, and that sunset is Penn State needed to do everything it could to convince themselves and the college football universe and the recruits out there who are watching closely that they are the next best team in the Big Ten Conference, and then there's a gap. And I think they've done that. And, I mean, I wasn't sure that they'd be able to. Um, I, I think anybody was going to stand in a soapbox after this team went fell to 6-2, and two the way they lost to Ohio State, what we've seen in the last two years collectively and kind of the responses to adverse situations. I wasn't going to be preparing to the end of my October saying, here comes a 4-0 November, but we've been talking about it on the podcast and saying, it's there for you. And because of the way this roster is tailored, because of the way this roster is trending, it's skewing younger, it's there for you to seize momentum and run with it into December and into next year. And they've done that. I mean, 130 to 24 is the combined margin right now between these three games. If you're a Penn State fan, you can nitpick what happened in the first quarter this week, what happened in the first quarter a couple weeks ago. Uh, you, you could talk about wanting to see Drew Aller in there early, although James Franklin talked about it again. He's not really encouraged to put Drew Aller behind uh, you know, a hodgepodge mix of backup linemen who really wouldn't be playing if it weren't for injuries. And that, let's go back to that before I finish the point on how well they've been playing. No Parker Washington today, who's your leading receiver. We already mentioned Joey Porter Jr. is out. Olu Fashionu misses a third consecutive game. We're, we're what uh, three or four weeks removed from this guy being the biggest riser out of just about anybody on the NFL draft board. Um, and here you are. I mean, it's a ho-hum, stress-free, not a lot to shake your head about result for James Franklin and company. And they'll go back to town and be considered very strong favorites to win a 10th game. That would be four times in seven years that they could get to a double-digit win total. And we would assume that would be four times in seven years that they get to a New Year's six game. And all of a sudden, you're dealing with that kind of program reset that Mark Brennan has talked a lot about on this podcast in the past few weeks, making sure you're exactly where you were when you walked off the field uh, after a Cotton Bowl victory in December 2019, when it felt like you had all this ascending talent on your roster and you were already in a really good spot as a program. Definitely. I think that you look at who made a lot of the contributions today. A lot of these guys are going to be back. Obviously, Jair Brown is going to be gone, and that's going to be a huge loss. But Kobe King uh, is going to be back. Um, the running backs, Nick Singleton, uh, had had the 100-yard kick return. And then you go back to the defense. I think when you think about that 2019 team 
and the ascending talent and who is poised to have a big year, the one guy who pops into your head is Micah Parsons because of how he closed that year, what he did in the Cotton Bowl. And then you look at this team this year, and there's another linebacker wearing number 11 who is doing Mm -hmm. some very similar things on the football field and Abdul Carter. And you can just kind of see see these pieces uh, that can fit together. Obviously, you're going to have to do some retooling um, in the offseason because you have some guys who are out of eligibility. There's going to be standard attrition. Like, it's going to be different next year. But the building blocks really are there on, on both sides of the ball. And I think that that's something that is just really, really promising for this team. Um, you know, yeah. There's going to be some questions going into next year. But from where we stand right now, it's a just a very bright future. Yeah, you talked the Parsons Carter parallel. Maybe maybe uh, Carter's one year behind of where Parsons was at that point as an established sophomore All American. You look at the running backs. You thought you were getting Journey Brown, Noah Kane, Devin Ford, younger. You know, but this is different. Nick Singleton and Katron Allen are making history. And and I know by the way, you had a redshirt sophomore Sean Clifford on that team who people by that point in the season were definitely wondering is he going to be that kind of a championship caliber quarterback already in his career. He's played a lot of football since then. I don't think he's proven a lot of those people wrong, but you got Drew Aller waiting in the wings. So again, the dynamics are different, but you're winning with that blend of youth and experience. And and, and with those running back, Katron Allen, Nick Singleton, this time it's Katron Allen's turn to, to step into that spotlight with 100 yard plus rushing performance after Singleton did it last week. And the week before that, Katron Allen scored three rushing touchdowns. And it doesn't seem like anybody steps away from the spotlight too long between these two, Daniel. But they're the first freshman tandem in Big Ten history. They played a lot of football in this conference. I know you know that. <laughs> to reach 700 yards on the ground together, they've got another game to add to that total, and they've got another game beyond that to add to that total. We are witnessing J. Juan Sider, Mike Yersich, uh, James Franklin, and the Catron Allen and Nick Singleton's dreams come true in this first season. I, I just can't imagine you getting – these kind of results, even in your wildest imagination, because it was all hinging on a big step forward for the program from an offensive personnel and offensive execution standpoint, it's happened in front of our faces. And right now there's a reason why people are saying this is the next big running back tandem in college football. And uh, it's, it's, it's on display on a weekly basis at this point. That the the two, two freshmen with, with 700 yards was just a very, yeah, you know, the the way that you can move stats around now, I mean, you can kind of almost get anything out of them. But the other names that were on that list of of guys who have done something similar to that, um, you know, you've got Steve Slayton and Pat White on that list from West Virginia. Todd Gurley. I got a Keith first Marshall. hand look at those two, man. I got a first hand <laughs> look at those two West Virginia guys, and they were legit. They were scary. Yeah, and then you look at that Oregon, you know, some of those Oregon teams that were the the ground and pound, C.J. Verdell, Travis Dye, Todd Gurley, Keith Marshall uh, at Georgia. You know, it it's good. It's players that were facing good competition, which Katron Allen and Nick Singleton are. And the fact that they're able to produce like this so early, it's just it, there's a you, there can just be so much excitement around it because I think the one thing that we've learned a lot about. Um, in college football and just the way that football in general is trending is that you need to have multiple running backs who can get the job done. Um, At the college level, it's because guys want to have tread left on the tire when they get to the NFL. In the NFL, it's because the game is so brutal uh, that you need to have someone waiting in the wings because it's really hard to make it through a season 100% healthy. So I just think that this, the way that Penn State has constructed the roster Obviously, that depth behind them, a uh, little scary uh, at this point in the year. But, you know, getting those two guys in and, and having both of them be able to contribute, both of them be able to be really good. I think today we saw those explosive runs from Gatron Allen, a 59 yarder and a 32 yarder that had been kind of that had been more Nick Singleton's domain um, so far this season. But to see Gatron Allen get out there uh, into the open field. You know, Rutgers was the type of team where, um, you know, it was a little bit shakier on the defensive side of the ball. So there are a couple more holes, I think, for Katron Allen, and he was just able to get a lot deeper uh, into that defense. But that's just really what you you wanted to see. I mean, I just think that it just changes the complexion um, of this team so much. Obviously, you're going to talk about the quarterback. People love to talk about the quarterback. 
a quarterback who's been around for, for six years and has started uh, like 45 games, I think at this point, um, people Next have week, a, don't, don't, don't rush him. Uh, oh, it's still 44. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just a lot of different, you know, people have a lot of things to say. People have a lot of thoughts, but I think being able to lean on that running game just really changes the complexion of it. Um, and like in this scenario, it's, okay, like Sean Clifford doesn't have to try to win the game. Um, it's We know what his ceiling is. We know the type of quarterback he is. When you kind of spin this forward, it's going to be, oh, the first year starting sophomore sensation isn't going to have to try to win the game all by himself. It's lessening the pressure on him, which, okay, maybe that can raise his ceiling um, a little bit. So th- things are just you know fitting together very well. Um, like we said, wasn't perfect today but it's just it's so easy to be you know tantalized by by what is out there ahead of this program and to your point i thought it was just perfect that that drew aller gets in the game that the tv broadcast it starts you know, hyping him up and as as they should and talking about what he represents for the future uh he hands the ball off twice gaytron allen scores uh, gets scores and gets 67 total yards on the ground and they walk off the field with six more points, and that was Drew's job on that on that series. And, and that's exactly – that's okay. That is just fine. Um, I think it's really just you, – you kind of assess the group that they have right now um, and the numbers that they've produced on both sides of the football. Um, you talked about the 40 tackles for loss. They almost matched that, that record they set two weeks ago, right? 16 tackles for loss at Indiana, 15 tackles for loss today against Rutgers. And then you go across the trenches and um, early on, especially they were working through some things up front, pass protection uh, wasn't where it had been in the last couple of games. Overall uh, you had Penn state, uh, you had Rutgers uh, get it, do a nice job of getting numbers on them in the backfield. And uh, Franklin said they made some adjustments with their Mike, a uh, linebacker identification, some pre-snap stuff. Um, and I want to give some love here to juice Scruggs because we've given Sean Clifford a ton of, of credit. But one thing I noticed pre-snap here was was a lot of verbal a lot of just pointing uh, you know you can only pick up so much when, when you're watching from afar but Drew Scruggs it seemed like a lot of times was checking in with his guys that were alongside him uh reassuring them and making sure everyone was on the game plan he didn't leave this field for a long time it says a lot to about how they felt beyond him maybe wanting to put Drew out there and, and having Drew Scruggs out of that equation and that, what that would have meant for the rest of the offensive line they rely on him and he's to me kind of a dark horse MVP ish candidate. When you talk about this Penn state team, will he be back next year for that bonus sixth year? I have no idea right now what his decision is going to be, but I do know that right now uh, he is a tremendously vital, uh, vital component. I think if you remove him from this equation, I wonder if they're able to, to keep on keeping on with the November that they've had. Cause I think he is a spearhead right now. One of our listeners uh, tweeted at me and said that he wanted me to say that G. Scruggs is Penn State's best center since A.K. Shipley. I didn't watch A.K. Shipley play, so I, I can't be an authority on that. But I think when you look at all the moving parts that have been on the offensive line, G. Scruggs has been the lone constant. He's the only one that's really been wire to wire to this point um, in the season. And I think that's just super, super significant. We've heard so much about how he's grown as a leader how he's grown as a communicator. And I think that combined with what Sean Clifford is able to do in the pre-snap and and Clifford's command at the line of scrimmage, I think that that just really boosts what this offense is capable of um, in terms of getting guys in the right position um, and and being able to make those adjustments. It's uh, kind of an an underrated part of it um, sometimes, but I think to have that kind of command uh, and to have a center who can have that kind of command, um, I think it's really good with just all the moving parts. You know, at this point, Juice Scruggs and Sal Wormley, the the right guard um, on this offensive line that that trotted out there today, they were the only two guys who were in this position on September 1st. Um, and Wormley has been banged up at times. He's been in and out of the lineup. Uh, whereas Scruggs hasn't. And I think that that just makes what he's, what he's accomplished, uh, you know, so significant. I mean, when I was in, spent three years uh, in that Eagles locker room, Jason Kelsey was a guy that they, that it always went back to where that center in the middle just means so much for him to always be there. Um, and to just be that presence, it just keeps everything together, no matter what's happening around him. As long as that guy in the middle is constant, has that command, the offensive line can tread water. Um, 
And I think that we've we've seen hints at that. You know, Drew Shelton you know, burned his red shirt today, which I'm sure we'll get to. Um, I'm writing about it later tonight. But he struggled a little bit early with Aaron Lewis, the the Rutgers defensive lineman. Um, and then, you know, there were some adjustments, things I think really tightened up. Um, but I think it just goes back to having Scruggs in the middle. Um, the fact that things might be going a little bit awry on the edges, but since you have that guy in the middle, you can adjust, you can figure things out. Uh, the success starts in the middle and I think kind of radiates out. You mentioned a red shirt burn. That's 10 red shirts burned now uh, for Penn State this year after burning two of those last year. There's a lot of personnel stuff that we can certainly dive into. Let's do that more so on Monday, and we'll have coverage at lines247.com. You have some punter conversation going on tonight, too. That was a bit of a different approach. That involved the freshman as well. Um, but, you know, sorting through some of the injuries, who's playing where. We'll do a lot more of that on Monday. I think, though, big picture here, spent about a half hour talking about this one. I want to finish off with what you felt, what you heard spending some time with the coaching staff, spending some time with the players after this matchup in SHI Stadium in Piscataway. They know what's ahead of them. They know you know, they're one win away from getting somewhere pretty special that a lot of people probably doubted their ability to get to this year. What was the vibe uh, coming out of this matchup? There's a lot of guys who were pretty excited and, and pretty confident and, and pretty loose. I spent a little bit of time with Kobe King. Uh, he said that that was his first touchdown since high school. Uh, at Cast Tech in Detroit, but that was a rushing touchdown. I think he said it was his first defensive touchdown since Little League. Uh, so it had been a very, very long time uh, since he was able to, to get in the end zone. Um, Curtis Jacobs, listen to Curtis Jacobs for a while, and he's always in a good mood. Uh, it seems like no matter what the result is and, and some good perspective. Um, and then Jair Brown talked for a while. And, you know, listening to him, we I wrote about him last week kind of how he knows what the what this means, how this is all ending. Um, he's really trying to savor the moment. He talks about that a little bit more um, and just kind of how he has enjoyed uh, being, being around this team. But I think the big theme that came up a little bit, it, it came up a little bit after the Minnesota game, came up again after the Indiana game, and then again after the Maryland game, is just the fact that this team hasn't let this stuff snowball that they've just done a good job with that leadership. Um, the guys that always come up are Jair Brown, PJ Mustafer, Sean Clifford. Um, the ability of, of that leadership to really keep this team focused, to not let these, you know, not let this snowball, not let this get out of control, not lose three games when, you know, when they lose one game. Um, I think that that really speaks to the job that some of these older guys have done, uh, those veterans. And I think that there's there's a lot of respect for for what they bring. Um, so I think that the team is just in you know a really good spot. I mean, I think that to be able to go in and <laughs> beat a team by 45 points in their stadium, uh, I think coming out of that, you just feel really, really good. Uh, I thought that James Franklin seemed pretty, you know, it's, it seems like sometimes after big wins, he can be fixated um, on a couple things that, that went wrong. Um, that didn't really seem to be the case. He you know, talked about the punting a little bit, some of the uh, special teams issues that, that Penn State had today. But at the same time, I mean, he was seemed so excited about Nick Singleton's uh, kick return for the touchdown. Uh, he seemed, I think, pretty proud about how you know Sean Clifford and, and some of the offensive linemen played. So... I just think that Penn State is in a really, really good spot right now. And, you know, I, you laid out that margin for these past three games. and It's, it's hard to – you can't blame them for feeling good right now. And one other thing he's, he seemed to feel very good about is the depth that they have cultivated and their ability to, to not make injuries an excuse. And you're in a situation where some of these injuries could serve as an albatross and you could understand and you could you – could, rationale if the margin was uh, closer if they struggled in some capacities they really haven't stopped moving at that pace and, and it says something about where they are we've talked about it since the first week of the season really them going deep in certain spots and then saying this is for emphasis this is for a reason we're not doing it on a weekly basis they wanted to establish depth they're able to show that a lot more when you're up by 45 points uh, but they've got a lot of guys in this locker room who are playing football and when you're at this point in the season and guys are trying to break through that wall and guys are trying to find a reason to physically and mentally get engaged on a day-to-day -day basis, when you got this many guys playing in the third and fourth quarter 
that's great for your football program. And, and I, and I we'll, we'll see what comes to this for Penn State. They got to get they got to answer the bell one more time in the regular season here against Michigan State. But everything is set up for them uh, to be exactly where they want to be going into December, considering where they were coming out of October. So, Daniel, we'll be back on Monday. We'll break down everything that we've learned since we had this post-game podcast, get a chance to digest some things. We'll have Mark Brennan back on. He'll have his team grades. He'll have his top takeaways up at lions247.com, where we've already got articles uh, coming your way. We'll have snap counts out of this one. It's a busy snap count because there are a lot of guys out there um, and and a lot more going your way at lions247.com, along with the latest in Penn State recruiting Stay with us over there. We'll be back with another podcast soon. Thanks for joining us for podcast uh, number 11 on of our post-game variety here in 2022. Uh, coming down to the wire, that's for sure. Daniel, great work at Piscataway. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Tyler. All right, folks. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast.